All right, so we on to um, video key for rotational momentum. <clears throat> and um, rotational momentum is something that's super awesome, um, super useful, and also not particularly well understood, um, which, which makes it difficult to like, have a solid grasp of it as an overarching concept. Um, and so the easiest way to approach this right now is to focus on the math of it, um, but we'll look at some conceptual applications of it as well. But basically it's um, the, the, you know, the angular analog of um, linear momentum or translational momentum. Uh, and, and what that means is it's mass, in motion and trying to continue maintaining constant motion. So in most uh, applications of translational momentum, you have things moving in straight lines and their tendency is to continue moving in straight lines at that same velocity. Uh, it's particularly difficult to stop them, especially when they have more motion and more inertia. So like we discussed, a large truck traveling at 80 miles an hour is significantly more difficult to affect its motion of a you know, small car traveling at 30 miles an hour, as an example. Now, the same thing is true of rotational things, except instead of uh, mass and velocity, rotational momentum uh, relates to uh, rotational inertia, I, and angular velocity, omega. So at its core, the equation is not complex. It's just that the rotational momentum or angular momentum L, as we call it, is equal to the angular mass, I, times the angular uh, velocity, omega, just like translational is P equals MV. Um, it's more difficult to sort of uh, visualize what rotational momentum is and uh, unfortunately, I don't have any of the stuff that I normally would have at work to show this. But um, if you imagine like a top spinning, right? If I just set a top down and don't spin it and I release it, it's going to fall over, right? Almost immediately. But if I spin the top, it stays upright for much longer. Why, right? It's still affected by the same gravitational forces. It still has the same shape and the same mass and all these things right? The difference is that when it's spinning, it has this sort of constancy of motion, mass in motion, rotational momentum, and its tendency is to continue that, right? It becomes more difficult to stop with more rotation, similar to how a car is more difficult to stop with more velocity. Furthermore, the heavier the top is, the longer it will spin for at the same velocity. Right? So the mass affects this too, but where rotational gets um, to really di uh, diverge from translational for momentum is that it's not just the mass and the velocity, it's the location of the mass as well. So for example, if I have a top, this is a top down, uh, top down, I get it. If I have a top that is a solid disk of mass M and a top that has the same mass m but is a ring of mass m this top will spin longer than this top at the same velocity why because here i is going to be um, mr squared and here I is going to be one half mr squared. So this disk of mass m radius r has more inertia than, I'm sorry, the ring has more inertia than the disk. Therefore, when it's in motion and it has that momentum, it'll have more angular momentum than the disk will, and therefore be more difficult to stop. Um, so that's that's sort of the the long and the short of rotational inertia. Uh, other conceptual examples uh, might include things like ice skaters, which is a classic, right? So um, 
angular momentum is constant. It's conserved. It's a conserved quantity, just like translational momentum is. So imagine an ice skater spinning with their arms out to the side. They have some L initial. And then that ice skater puts their arms over their head and they have some L final, they're spinning, okay? Conservation of angular momentum says that these two Ls are equal to each other. Angular momentum must be conserved. But something has changed about the situation, right? Because when you bring your arms in, you are changing the location of your mass. So by pulling your arms to towards the center of rotation, you're actually decreasing your rotational inertia, right? I is decreasing here because R is decreasing here. Therefore, your rotational velocity would have to increase as a result, right? In order to maintain a constant momentum, L, when I goes down, omega would have to go up. And as a result, the skater spins much more quickly when their arms are brought in than when they're sticking out to their sides. And if you have a swivel chair at home, you can test this for yourself, especially if you have some like hand weights or something, put those hand weights in your hands, extend your arms all the way out to your sides, have somebody spin you and then pull your arms in and you will start to spin faster. Stick your arms out and you will spin slower again. Pull your arms in you'll spin faster again. Um, this is also the reason why divers or um, gymnasts tuck themselves when they're flipping by decreasing their radius and bringing their body in as close as possible to the pivot point. They decrease their rotational inertia, thereby increasing their rotational velocity and spinning faster. So it becomes more easy to uh, complete a rotation in a given amount of time. So. To the problems then, <laughs> here we have a light rigid rod. Ooh, I love that term light because it means it's massless and I don't have to care about it. Um, the rod has a length L and it connects two particles of known mass. Note that this distance from each particle to the origin is going to be L over two or half a meter. So I'm given r that's l over 2 i'm given m right i'm also given the speed of each particle so let's call that v and that's translational again you can know for sure it's translational because of the units there determine the angular momentum i need L. In order to find L, that's my end goal, right? I will need to know I and omega. So I is pretty straightforward. I is going to be I1 plus I2. That's M1 R1 squared plus M2 R2 squared. Or if you want to be fancy, it's M1 plus M2 times R squared because they are at the same distance from the pivot point. Boom, there's your I. Omega is equal to V over R. So um, that's, you know, it doesn't get much easier than that to solve for. And then calculating L would be I times Omega. So there you go, done. So there's my answer right there. Um, direction of angular momentum is a bit complicated and it's probably, uh, well, it's definitely not something that you have to know for the exam this year because the only way to do it is to like draw it really. Um, and so we're not going to worry about that right now. Um, you could say it's counterclockwise here if you wanted to. Now, what would be the new angular momentum of the system if each of the masses were instead a solid sphere, 12.5 centimeters in diameter? 
Now, I'm going to take a sort of different approach to answering this part of the question because you'll notice that in my little answer key that it's showing on my version, the answer to part one was 24.5, and the answer to part two is 24.653. They're almost exactly the same. And that would be the best conceptual way to answer this, right? In part one, we assumed that these were particles, right? So basically, they're so dense that they have a radius of zero. Obviously, if we change the situation, so we have our rod and we have two very large radii, this changes the distribution of mass, right? Like half of the mass is going to be pretty far away, and the other half of the mass is going to be much closer to the pivot point for each of these objects, right? Um, and does that matter? It does. And these two things technically do not cancel out, right? You can't say, oh, well, because some of it's further and some of it's closer, it's no longer relevant that the, those two changes are equal and opposite. And they cancel. And the reason that they don't cancel is that R is not directly proportional to I. R is squared in this equation. So making R bigger uh, and then squaring that large increase is going to have a significant impact and making r smaller and then squaring that distance is going to have a significant impact as well so um it is not an equivalent statement that being said because this distance is so small right when you uh have the diameter of each sphere is 12.5 that means that the change in r is going to be just half that because it's the radius, right? So that'd be 6.25 centimeters, 0.0625 meters. Compared to the length of this rod, that's negligibly small. And so it's reasonable to say, yeah, it'll be something, but it's not going to be something significant enough to really measurably change my answer. If you want to get into the math of what this actually would do, the best way to do it is to utilize the parallel axis theorem. Um, I'm not going to go through all that because it's an unnecessary amount of work here. Moving on to the next question. Um, we have a counterweight attached to a light cord. Ooh, love that. Massless cord wound around a pulley, and it's a thin hoop. So a thin hoop, okay, that tells me that I'm going to use I equals MR squared as my rotational inertia um, formula. We're given the radius, we're given the masses, uh, and the spokes themselves have negligible mass, so cool. Um, all right, so things that I'm given, I'm given the M and M, I'm given R, and I'm given um, the shape, right, that, it, that it's a hoop. So part one here, or part A rather, asks for net torque. Net torque, well, what are the objects that are torquing the system? This is going to be defined by the torque of the counterweight on disk. Um, or the pulley, rather, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that torque of the counterweight is going to be RF. I'll make that a lowercase r because I usually do. RF sine theta. Well, R is R. It's given to us, right? F is gravitational force. So that's M, little m, in this case, times G. Sine theta, where theta is 90. So this net torque is just going to be R, M, G. Done. Now, when the counterweight has a speed V, the pulley has an angular speed, omega equals V over R. Remember that that's just the definition of um, the relationship between omega and V. Determine the magnitude of total angular momentum of the system about the axle of the pulley. So this becomes uh, a complicated thing to consider because it's asking solely for angular momentum, right? 
saying, what is L? But there are two objects moving here, right? So L is going to be equal to L of the disk plus L of the uh, counterweight. L of the disk is easy. That's I times omega, and omega is V over R. It's given to us. Note that um, this answer is going to be written in terms of V, by the way. So you don't need to know V in order to answer this question. But the second part is like, what? How does the counterweight have rotational momentum? Because it's not moving in a circle, right? The counterweight is falling down. Now, this takes sort of a relativistic um, viewpoint, but any object that is moving could be described as having some rotational momentum relative to a given point. Because what rotation really is, is a series of points that are moving in instantaneous straight lines, right? Where that straight line just changes every instant. So um, while we don't have sort of a, a, a formula for um, L in terms of translational objects, we do know that we can convert between translational and rotational by multiplying by R. So just as uh, V equals omega R, P equals LR, and L for a translating object is equal to P over R. So I could say L total is gonna be I disk omega disk plus P counterweight, it's translational momentum divided by R. And P counterweight is just M, sorry, that should be a plus, is just it's M times it's V. So this would be big M for the disk, R disk squared times omega v over r plus little m v over r that's uh big m r squared v plus m v all over r which would be m r squared plus m v over r and this right here is your answer right that would i know big m i know r i know little m and i know r solve for that and that is your coefficient that you would place in front of that v now lastly for this problem we're asked to find the acceleration of the counterweight. That is A, translational acceleration, right? Again, units are meters per second squared. It tells me I'm looking for the translational acceleration. In order to find that, I will need to know the rotational acceleration. And rotational acceleration is defined by net torque equals I alpha. That's Newton's second law applied to rotation. So in order to um, take this the last step further, I also would have um, this relationship for torque. Net torque is the derivative of L over dt, just like net force is the derivative of momentum with respect to time to draw another uh, parallel between rotational and translational. So here's the deal here. I already know the net torque. This is from part A. I already know this uh, angular momentum 
from part B. Right? And uh, so this becomes 100% solvable um, by substituting in and then um, solving for that uh, derivative there. So lastly, we're on to um, the summer internship at NASA where we are designing a space station that simulates gravity. This is an awesome question and it's very real. This actually works. Um, you probably have at least seen video of, if not experienced for yourself, those rides at amusement parks where you're inside a sort of disc, like a, a hoop um, with your back up against the inside wall of it. And it spins really, 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 really fast. And it sort of squishes you up against the wall and then they drop the floor out underneath you. It's called the, the gyrotron or something like that, I think. Um, and it keeps you pressed up against the wall like you're being crushed against it. Well, that's just simulated acceleration. It's simulated gravity. And we could use the same principle on a, a space station to make it seem like we're not in zero G when we are. So we're given the shape of this hollow ring. So I already know off the bat I'm using MR squared for my I. We're given the mass of this ring. Everything outside for the ring itself has a negligible mass compared to the ring, so you don't have to consider it. We also know the radius of this whole thing, R. Um, and uh, the last part is we have these two rockets, and these rockets are basically exerting forces tangent to the outside edge of the ring. Right? We know the force of the rockets. And we know that we want acceleration equal to G. So putting this all together, what this problem ultimately does is it um, connects circular motion to rotational motion, right? Because uh, this is an object moving in a, uh, any person on this object, I should say, person standing inside of this is gonna be rotating um, in, in a circular path. So we'll start with this. That person will be experiencing an acceleration equal to G. That acceleration specifically is a centripetal acceleration, right? Any person on the outside edge is rotating in a circle where their acceleration is always directed towards the center of the circle. And that would have a V tan squared over R formula. So I can say G equals V tan squared over R. And from that, uh, I can get that tangential velocity is going to be equal to the square root of G R. Now, the last part of this is um, I need every point on that outside edge to have that velocity, right? I know that um, the, the force of the rockets on the object is constant. There are a couple ways we could approach this now. I'm going to solve it the angular way because it's an angular problem set, right? So I'm going to take this number and pop it down here so I have some more room. The, the tangential velocity equals the square root of gr. That means that the rotational velocity is equal to uh, v over r. So that'd be the square root of gr over r. Okay. And that's uh, the velocity at my largest point, right? So this is going to be my final velocity where, where I'm spinning fast enough to have um, my simulated gravity be equal to G. My initial omega was zero. So my delta omega is uh, the, the square root of GR over R. <laughs> Now, what is delta omega? 
Well, delta omega is caused by a rotational acceleration, alpha. Alpha is equal to net torque over I. And net torque is equal to do, 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 um, R times F of the rockets times sine of 90 degrees because the rockets fire perpendicular to the surface. And this happens twice because there are two rockets. So I'd get alpha is equal to 2RF rocket divided by I, which is MR squared. Boom, now I know alpha. Lastly, I could say um, delta omega equals alpha T, right? I know my omega now, I know my alpha now, and I can solve for the time required to do that. This is my kin uh, rotational kinematic stuff. The other way that we could solve this problem is to just look at it linearly and say, here's the velocity of every point, right? And I could use conservation of momentum here. The other way I could do this, this is like alternative, would be to do it um, linearly and say, every single point here is going to come up to a speed of square root of gr. Every single point. All of the points have a combined mass of m. So we have a change in momentum here. That change in momentum is equal to mv. That's going to be m times, this is uh, linear momentum, by the way, is going to be m times um, the square root of gr. And f times t equals delta p. That's the impulse momentum theorem. I know this f, so I get t equals m times the square root of gr over uh, f where that F is the total force of the rocket, so that'd be two times the individual force. And that's that, which is kind of cute. Uh, the last part here for part B is um, the period of rotation. So that's time per rotation. And that's also pretty straightforward to do because I could say delta X, the total, uh, or sorry, rather D, the total distance traveled is equal to um, the circumference, C, of the circle, which is 2 pi r. Um, and then the velocity is square root of gr. Time equals uh, distance divided by velocity. And then I'm done. Yay! So that's this whole problem set, and I hope that you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. I hope that you enjoyed it more.